Hello, everyone. I am uh, Claudia Murgan, the host of the Spiritual Inspired uh, podcast. And uh, my uh, guest today is uh, Nicola Henderson. Um, she was born in uh, Canada and um, she traveled to Australia, where she fell in love with the place and never left. She also loved fast and expensive cars. So she worked in the automotive industry for many years, from service to sales to account management to recruitment. 15 years later, Nicola had her big spiritual awakening and decided it was time to make a change. Since then, she had worked with many healers, coaches, practitioners, and mentors to assist her on her journey of embodying trust, empowerment, freedom, and joy. It is Nicola's belief that we are all here on earth right now during the Great Awakening for very special and unique reasons, and we play together to assist in Earth's and Universe's ascension process. Nicola, thank you very much for uh, joining me today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Uh, so I'll start by asking you if you still uh, are into fast and expensive cars. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that that ever dies. You know, mm -hmm. there is a joke in the automotive industry that once you're in the automotive industry, you basically die in the automotive industry. I have um, managed to get out, but I still, my eye certainly is caught by um, certain expensive cars. Absolutely. Yeah. So do you think that the electric cars will benefit the humanity as much as it is uh, being displayed and brought to our uh, faces today? That's a, that's a really good question. My mother, who's massively into everything um, eco and electric, would say 100%, 150% yes. Um, I... Um, I think it's it's all moving in the right direction is my perspective on it. Um, it's it's less pollutants. Um, I think we can probably take a page out of Europe's book as well on this stuff because they have a lot of they have a lot more public transport that's a lot easier to use. They use bicycles a lot more. I think everything is changing. Electric cars are a step in the right direction, but we've sort of exploded and then it feels like we're coming back home to see what's in our own backyard kind of thing. And I think even staying and enjoying our own local turf and making that a lot more special and maybe not even needing cars could be a way of moving forward as well. Yeah, because recently I posted a, a short video on uh, the um, hypocrisy on this subject because I am all for, you know, nature and environmental uh, protection. I write about this stuff, but at the same time, electric cars still need uh, us digging uh, the earth for rare metals uh, and, um, you know, free energy engines or water-based engines have been discovered a hundred years ago. And we still don't mm. want to use these technologies which are non-polluting and maybe zero carbon footprint. So we should go back to those technologies, not to something electric, which is still requires uh, some kind of pollution. Mm -hmm. I agree, I agree, yes. So now that we are done with the cars, let's uh, mark your <laughs> spiritual path and the healers and you know the, the mentors you work with and maybe um, touch on how your big awakening happened. Mm-hmm. You know, I've been reflecting on this a lot in the last couple of weeks. I mean, the last year, let's be real, since I've had the awakening. But really, like, it's interesting to, to look back and observe the markers and the different stages and phases that one goes through, through the awakening experience. And I mean, once the, from, so I think I know, a spiritual awakening can either be like, rapid or it can be fairly like gentle and just you just sort of coast through and you learn as you go and it's not super disruptive um mine was certainly disruptive uh in the best way possible but le and leading up to that i was i had bouts of being really unhappy unhappy and holding a lot of despair that and i was like what is going on like is this existential angst like i do not understand what is going on inside me right now but it was like the way I could describe it was like my insides are crying. I was yearning for something so much more. And I um, watched a, 
so it was a bit, it was an interesting evolution, but what sparked my awakening was Elizabeth Wood, who I know you've had on your series as well. Um, it was a conversation I watched with her about a year ago when she was on another summit and she was talking about how we're not alone and how, you know, there's definitely other beings in the universe and humanity experiment in consciousness. And I was, that, that was it for me like to understand that we're part of a a grander plan, a bigger scheme, if you will. We're part of a network throughout the universe um, and not just on planet Earth wondering what the hell the point is, basically. (laughs) That was my awakening. And from there, I, I started to just absorb as much as I possibly could in terms of learning from people discovering who I was. Um, I eventually quit my job. I moved out of, I was living in Brisbane. I now live up on the Sunshine Coast. So I got out of the city and I have a beautiful little place here. Basically changed everything. I spent a ton of money on this development over the last year, but it's been the best thing I've ever done for myself because I now get to, I figured out what my soul work is, what my purpose work is. And there's no better feeling than that in the world. Yeah. yeah. So what other healers you, you work with? Yeah. Um, ah, there's so many to, to, to note. My friends would joke like, Nick, like, can you please do up a spreadsheet for us? We're really like getting lost in all of the people that you're working with. So, um, and it slowed down, which is great. I'm kind of in this integration phase now, but initially I did ascension training with Wishela Sananda. So that was a three month program. And that really helped give me the fundamentals. Like it helped me understand triggers in a different way, um, you know, and, and just basically get a, a broad view of many t- different topics that come up when you start to open your eyes to spiritual person in this capacity. Um, I did some activations with Margarita Alcantara. She was really influential as well because she's pretty hardcore about like, are you a light worker? Are you here? Cause you have something to do, do it like, you know, and sort of helping like pushing people off the cliff, if you will, like go on, go on, go on. So I worked with her and it was challenging, but it was good. Um, I have, uh, <sighs> Who else have we got here? There's so I did a course earlier this year with Aurika Valan, who is a woman's sexuality and embodiment coach, and the program was called Erotically Embodied, and that was a life changer, a game changer as well. That was a seven week program on basically learning how to feel, which has been integral in my own journey, and just instead of not feeling. <laughs> Or not knowing what to do when you have all these weird things going on inside your body, learning how to process and work through that. Elizabeth would as well. I've just started um, or signed up for some mentoring with her as well, because I just love everything about her. So I want to absorb that energy for a while and be in her field. Um, Yukia Sandara was really influential as well. She's living in Peru now, so somewhere in your neck of the woods there. Um, <laughs> But uh, I did a program with her and she sparked my second awakening, just sort of deepened everything and then did some mentoring as well with her. And, and there's, there's many more people that I've worked with in between. Um, But really I've taken something different from each person or multiple things, multiple different things from each person. And I've pulled that into my field and made it my own, which is the most special part because everyone's different. They all teach something different. And now I get to put my own spin on it and share that with other people. Yeah, interesting. And you mentioned um, triggering and uh, self-triggering is a very dangerous, uh, you know, mental activity these days. And it can put our mind on a slippery path that sometimes is very hard to recover from. Uh, Also, it's a very energy draining. How can we control such uh, triggers? Did you say self-triggering? Yes. I've never heard of self-triggering before. It's like um, you hear a piece of news, which kind of triggers you, but at the same time, you do it to yourself because you don't control the way you react. 
Um, mm. And there are many news these days who are, which are very disturbing. And you can say that that news triggered me, but at the same time, maybe we can say self-triggering because again, we are not in control of our own reactions and our own feelings. Uh, but if it's easier to discuss about triggering, then we can talk about that, not necessarily self-triggering. Mm. Yeah, that's an interesting distinction. I guess it's sort of, it goes, sorry, the dog is in the room. <laughs> Just hopefully you can't hear him barking too loud. Um, yeah, self-triggering. I mean, so that sounds really interesting. Benny, stop it. Um, sorry, edit that bit out. <laughs> so self-triggering, I think that that sounds... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? When you like beat yourself, you know, those monks. Um, Flagellation. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Like, I don't think that we need to do that. If people are purposely looking for triggers, that's totally <clears throat> crazy in my opinion. But I mean, if people are watching the news and they know they get triggered from it, but they still watch the news, I mean, that's, I guess, their thing to work through themselves. Like, what do you get from watching the news? What are, is your body having an addict? Is there, is there an addictive reaction going on in your body that you get from the watching the news, even though it's negative? So you're craving that possibly there could be something biological going on there, but I personally love triggers. I certainly don't go seeking them out, but I don't go, I don't run away from them either. Um, they can feel they're loaded with information which is why I love them. And I love also not, I've, up until going through this year, I've been very uh, easily influenced. Something would happen around me. Someone would say something or do something. And I would be like, oh, you know, I'd like go into like, oh, what have I done? This sort of thing, like a weird trauma response in itself. However, I've now developed the awareness and the robustness one would say within myself to be able to say, okay, what's going on here? I'm having this emotion, this reaction inside my body and it's really hot. It's burning. What is it that I'm attaching to this? Can I detach from the situation, observe the emotions and the feelings going on in my body at, at the same time, observe the stories that I'm attaching to those feelings and then be able to look at them both and say, what is it that I need to learn from this? Like I'm allowing the emotion to move through there's a story here that needs to be inspected and to be rewritten. Really. It's not, it's looking to come out to the light and not be stuck in me anymore. So, and then we get to be filled with more light and love and less density and pain and trauma. Yes. Fantastic. And then I, I made a promise to also look at all these news with uh, whatever news will reach me um, to look at mm -hmm. uh, them very detached and, um, stop any type of uh, reaction because it doesn't help my energy field for sure. And it will just um, lower it down instead of uh, bring it up. Um, so that's a promise which I will um, watch myself to, to follow uh, as much as possible because um, otherwise we will fall into this trap of, of fear and uh, it's not good for, uh, for us, for sure. Yeah, there's nothing to fear. Take yeah. everything with a grain of salt. Yeah. Like I don't really believe much at all unless it comes from my own heart. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> there are big transformations taking place in the world right now. And, you know, people are being <clears throat> divided by false uh, reasons. And Australia, where you live right now, is at the forefront of this ugly behavior. So it seems that politicians lost their common sense and the power to think straight. Do you feel a, a disturbance in the energy field that causes this type of uh, behavior? Hmm. You know, how I see it, I'm, I'm where I live. I haven't been influenced by all the craziness that's happening in New South Wales and Victoria. So it's easy for me to take the outside perspective and the observer perspective on this. But what I am seeing, what I find really exciting is that Australians are waking up now. 
we, Australia as a, as a country and as a nation is often a, a, a bit further behind the rest of the world. Um, you know, legalizing gay marriage is a good example. That came way later than many other, you know, big countries in the world. Um, and, you know, if we look back and I love Australians and I love Australia, but it's founded and essentially, you know, when it was, um, you know, when Captain Cook arrived back in the late 1700s on a, as a nation of convicts. So that's a really interesting um, genetic history of many of the people that live here. And there's like, there's some grit there and there is some toughness and some resilience. And, um, you know, these people start waking up and seeing what the oppression that's happening. I mean, shit's going to go down. <laughs> that's the best way that I can put it. Like, yeah. not, it's just, it's not going to stand. It's, and it's probably going to be, it's going to be, um, an interesting display to observe, but having have I don't watch the news. Little bits trickle into my field, um, so I hear a bit of it, a bit about it here and there. I've had a couple sessions with people living in other parts of the country, and um, I'm I'm okay. I'm good because I see the 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 bird's eye view, the bigger picture of things. And I'm excited about it. However, it is challenging for other people, especially I had a session with a teacher and she's very much um, aware of what's happening and finds the fact that she can't talk about, um, you know, what's really happening or even, you know, talk about wearing masks or not wearing the masks and what emotions this might bring up in children, et cetera. Um, she found that really challenging. And I think that, you know, and she said, what, what else can I do? And I think these people who are waking up in these challenging professions, you know, in the medical industry as doctors or teachers, et cetera, are probably needed exactly where they are to, to hold the line, as Peter Smith says. Um, I just had a gratitude series myself and, you know, it's, we need, we need them there. We need people exactly where they are to maintain their frequency and, and hold the line. It's not going to last forever. Yeah, I, I think that uh, the um, psychological mutilation um, that was done to the kids, to the children in general, all over the world was intentional. Um, and that's a kind that's of a state. criminal act. And these guys will have to yeah. pay for it one way or another. Uh, because yeah. children shouldn't have been exposed to, to such um, cruelty, uh, knowing that there is no risk for them to get sick or <clears throat> transmit the, the virus or anything like that. So that's just um, yeah. criminal behavior, in, in my opinion. I agree. Yeah, it's, it's devastating, but it's, it's all going to be fine. Yes. We've got it. <clears throat> They're incredible little humans, all these kids running around. Yes. Australia has a lot of, uh, you know, sacred sites and uh, Uluru is the most um, active and well-known uh, one of them. Um, have you visited uh, Uluru or any other sites? I've been across mm -hmm. Australia, um, but I have never been to Uluru. Uh, and I just clued into the fact that that's what's behind you right now, which is amazing. <laughs> so funny just so focused on you um yeah I haven't been there my mother who's lives in the UK and she's English she's been here and took the GAN from Darwin to Adelaide and Uluru is her favorite place and she's dying to go with me so I will get there one of these days but I mean there's so Australia is such an interesting country have you been here yourself Claudia? yes 2005 but it was uh -huh. a business trip in and out uh, one week uh, just visited um, Canberra uh, Sydney and uh, Newcastle uh -huh. so it's got a really special energy to it because it's so old but it's so new at the same time like it's because white people haven't been here for that long so how built up it is there's not a lot of old history here but it's still such an old raw hot 
country. So it's got a really interesting dynamic, but raw is a really good way that I would, a good word I would use to describe it. But there's, yeah, there's, I've had a lot of really cool experiences here, bush camping and all sorts of things. Yeah, I've seen a lot of the country. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Before uh, we started this uh, conversation, we touched a little bit on um, psychedelics. So um, have you tried before or anything similar to psychedelics? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I have had one ceremony with uh, acacia, which is like the Australian ayahuasca. And that was earlier this year. And it was actually, it ended up being the day after another like quantum consciousness journey that I did, which was just of sound mind, like a guided sort of, you go into a different state of mind and you go through and meet different versions of yourself. So it's really gentle and beautiful. And then the next day I went and I did this acacia ceremony, which is in a beautiful space and, you know, it was all good. And it was, uh, it was, it set up, really nicely and referred through a friend um and it was they were very different experiences of course I think I preferred being uh like going through the quantum consciousness journey it was more gentle um on my body um I remember there being a point in the evening where so many people were being sick around me and it kind of like snapped me out of it. And I was just like, Whoa, I was like, I got to get out of here, man. This is crazy. Like I kind of went to this, you know, this other sort of being and I didn't, I didn't come back from it. So I didn't probably, I had, I had some cool experiences through it. And I do remember seeing like different shapes and, you know, having the visual things going on. It was in this, this big yurt in the middle of, the jungly forest here near Brisbane and it had all these lines going up and, you know, it was really cool. It looked like an eye in the middle and stuff, but, and so, and it was really neat. And something that Elizabeth Wood said, I think it's some tribes back in Africa as children, like the parents actually give children um, some psychedelic substance substance only two or three times while they're growing up. And then they, they, they have that doorway that's accessible to them moving forward. They never have to do it again because they know how to go into that state of mind and achieve those states of consciousness without having the, um, the substance. So I kind of have a taste of that. So it was, it was okay. I, would I do it again? Initially I said no, but now I think I probably would, but it would really have to be the right space with the right people. Um, and the right time yes. yeah and i know about uh, the kids from africa especially in cameroon i interviewed uh, marie and Booney, and when she mm. was i think 12 or 13 there is this um, <clears throat> procession or custom uh, for the girls to uh, go from um, being a girl to a woman and for the boys from being a boy to, to a man this transition mm. and uh, while the the boys um, trials are very very harsh uh, the girls are just being given eboga uh, tree bark to uh, bark tree to to chew on, and they will get visions and messages. And <clears throat> yes, they can even um, start healing others through the properties um, this um, transmission um, will will give them. And uh, on the aspect of yeah. you know people being uh, sick around you, uh, being sick during a ceremony is very healing. And at one point I was, you know, proud of myself that I had never been sick during these ceremonies. But now I understand that it was kind of foolish of me not to force myself to take that um, um, feeling and that um, substance which was inside me out of the body because it's part of the process. And it has to be done that way because, you know, Mother Ayahuasca knows better. Um, so if you feel sick, just let yourself be sick and, you know, purge if necessary because it is part of the healing process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe next time. Yeah. I felt nauseous, which I'm not, I do not like nauseous. I've been car sick as a kid for many years. So I was just, 
yeah, but I hear you. I, that makes sense. That makes sense. Let's touch on uh, your programs, you know, the um, human design, astrology, cosmic surgery. Let's take them uh, one by one. I really want to, to hear more about it. <laughs> sure. Um, so I now, so I have, a, I do coaching. So what I, what lights me up the most is coaching. I do a succession package with people. Um, and in like throughout that we weave in astrology and human design and cosmic surgery. Um, I don't really operate on a, on a structure per se. Um, there's certain, like I, we just roll with what needs to happen. I have certain foundational practices that usually come up with people because things like trust and compassion and, um, you know, learning how to use the power of our mind and our heart is something that most people can relearn when they, when they enter into the awakening phase. Um, but cut, yeah. So, but to break those down, I mean, human design is, is a really, uh, fantastic tool and like, like anything and like everything, I always say, take what, what's take what resonates and leave the rest. I am working through removing myself from all of the boxes that I've put myself in through my life. And it's a, it's a structure and a tool and a system and it's helpful and assistive. However, it's not something that I, that I choose to um, say, Oh, I can't do that because I have an invitation. If I still want to do it, it might fall to shit, but I'm going to do it anyways whatever, you know, like I'm going to learn through that. If there's something that I want to do as a projector, my strategy is to wait for the invitation. So it's wonderful that you invited me on this today. That's always great. Um, you know, so yeah, so it's great for people to understand how their energy works and astrology is the same to understand that they have a sensitive soul that's maybe been unconscious to them. So I'm a cancer moon, but I'm a Virgo sun and a Sagittarius rising. So y'all are not going to see my squishy insides until you get to know me a little bit more. And when I get affected by other people and situations around me, I know that that's because I'm, I'm just sensitive. I'm a sensitive little sort, you know, and that helps me to understand, ah, that's why that happens. And now suddenly it's not this uncontrollable thing that happens in me. It's something that I can look at objectively and go, ah, that's okay. I don't have to get super reactive around this thing because I know myself better now. Um, and the, the cosmic surgery is something that I learned through my work with Yukia. So she talks about how people have different soul encodements. Um, and some we come in with when we're incarnated in this lifetime and some just get left back, like on the back burner. Um, you know, we don't need them this lifetime, but cosmic surgery and being able to track energy is something that comes naturally to me. Like once I realized I could do it, then I realized I could do it. Right. Um, and so that's been really assistive in helping people transform past pain and traumas um, and you know in that transformation it can be taking it and seeing it for the gift that it is through through a journey it's not necessarily a meditation but we go into the space, you know, there's a golden pillar of light, our guides are with us. Um, and we go in and we just see what comes up, what needs to come forth. And it, it sort of unlocks the next stage, the next level for them, if that makes sense. And it's really, it can be, it, it is really beautiful. But, and with that, there's always the need to be really um, diligent in how you do this as well, because sometimes it's not right for you to do that for them. Sometimes they need to work on this themselves and then you can follow that path with them. So it's really just about being really respectful and really aware and really conscious of what's coming through and what the person's journey is and, um, and just going from there and just trusting, of course, what you see. Um, and just downloaded and launched a program called soul group sessions as well which i'm very excited about because i'm relatively new to this to to i mean i've been a coach for a few years um putting it as my source of income and as my 
purpose work, you know, what I love to do and make money from it is amazing. Um, I've been doing just one-on-one sessions, but I've, I have launched a, it's a, it's a soul group sessions and it's four people in a group. It'll start early November, but it is going to be so transformative because people will have a teaching and then one-on-one coaching for each person in each session. And the stuff that's going to come forth is going to help, you know, with each person is going to help everyone else. So it's going to be a massively transformational experience, not just for people to work through their problems, but we're all being asked to figure out who we are. And that comes with some vulnerability. When you start opening your heart up for the world to see you and not shirking and not sort of closing back down again, that feels quite uncomfortable. It did for me, at least, you know, but you keep going and it's like, God, I feel so exposed. So in these, in these spaces, it's going to be great practice for people to learn that they can be open and vulnerable with other people. And we can all start to reconnect and come back together and love one another more deeply and and reduce this, this illusion of separation. Yes. And and they have to understand that during these sessions, um, you create a safe space for them. And that's important. And um, as long as they are in that safe space, um, it's again, it's safe for them to to be exposed, to be honest with themselves, and shouldn't be any other, you know, um, additional trauma or anything else that can affect them. It's just part again of the, the healing process. Exactly. <clears throat> yeah. And other than this um, uh, project, there is anything else you're working on these days? A book or planning a trip? <laughs> hmm. Not a, there's no book in the works at the moment. Um, I think at one, one day when the inspiration hits, I will write something. Um, What I am working on right now, and this is something that makes me feel vulnerable, which is probably why I'm putting off doing it a little bit. Um, but that is to, to really start sharing um, the, the gift that I have around light language and sharing that. So I want to create a few gifts for the people that are aware of me and my, you know, my email list and Facebook and Instagram and share that with them and on certain topics like freedom and empowered service and unity and trust and truth. And so share an energetic transmission of that channeling the energy of that through the of light, speaking a few English words on the matter um, and uh you know, and allow that to transform people as it's, as it's meant to, or catalyze them into a new space or open them up in some way. It can be, I really, really love light language because it can be so catalyzing and activating for people. And it, I keep seeing like a, like a key in a lock, um, kind of like those, those, you know, cosmic surgery journeys and stuff that we can go on as well. So that's, yeah, and more group stuff as well. I'm actually connecting with a woman this afternoon who does grounding ceremonies. She's indigenous and um, we get on very well and we're going to we want to create like a young women's circle and who knows what else is going to improve from that. Um, yeah, so I'm excited. Yeah, that's beautiful. And uh, your work should be, uh, and your service should be in demand uh, these days considering the, um, situation in, in Australia for, about which we already talked and uh, people are distressed, people are um, uh, disoriented based on uh, the fact that they cannot leave their homes and they are being uh, harassed by the police. And uh, I think something has to be done at uh, the national level, but without the intervention of the government, which we know won't go for it because they, they want to keep us in, in dark and in fear. Um, so maybe you can reach out to I don't know radio station or a TV station which is not already um, corrupted in their mentality and their programs and offer something which can reach national people nationwide and 
give some encouragement um, with this um, dire situation. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. Thank you. I'm going to do that too. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, I mean, I, I like to uh, to come up with this type of uh, solutions, and if you uh, you know gather up with this lady, and maybe you get Nicole um, Gruel, which is an amazing uh, Australian. She said this the um, uh, what's her term? The term she uses the samurai mother. Okay, samurai mother. Wow. She just gave birth wow. several months ago. And she was one of my guests. And when three powerful women get together, the message is even stronger. And you can have this type of um, weekly sessions where people can tap in and or join and listen and learn and uh, get hope. Yeah, yeah, love it. Fantastic. Yeah, there's so yeah. much um, power and electricity that can that that comes through other people. So um, yeah, and coming together, that's beautiful. Beautiful, yes. I'm making notes, thank you. <clears throat> and of course, because you have the um, indigenous person that will add, in my opinion, weight to, to the whole message because it's not only white faces. You have someone who lived there for generations and understand the land much better than you and me. Uh, can do and especially because Australia is a special place as we discussed and uh, <clears throat> that's part of the you know healing and appreciation process appreciating the land and uh, the indigenous uh, people over there yeah yeah it's like we're being called to go back to basics in a sense and something that I've recently been learning about is, um, you know, the, the cycle of women, the cycle of the earth, everything is cyclical. And the fact that we've lost such great touch with, with earth and with our own bodies is something that we're all coming back to now. Um, and there, there's so many resources out there. And there's a lot of people who can really teach us and show us the way as well. And I think, you know, you're talking about going to community is a, is a really wonderful way to reconnect with the land. And um, I've started just learning about menstruality and the different cycles and the phases that we go through as women and, the, you know, how our energy levels change and how our inner critic is louder in our inner um, in our autumn than any other phase. So it's, it's really just about awareness and, and getting back into the natural flow with life and natural connection with everything, as opposed to feeling it's like we've swung so far on the pendulum to thinking that we're these isolated beings it's crazy and we're we're inching back now the other way yes remembering that we are everything yeah we are going back to the community type of uh, mentality at least some of us uh, because this will yeah. be the only way to um, to survive instead of me having uh, you know five chickens to feed my family and you have five chickens to feed your family why not putting them together and you know feed our families and then sell the surplus or trade the surplus and then get something else and uh, uh, makes yeah. makes sense. And um, one of the benefits uh, of moving to, to Panama is that we spend a lot of uh, time in nature. We do a lot of grounding and even, uh, uh, you know, earlier today we went to the beach and we, we walked the beach. We, we just in, enjoy the, the weather. Um, so that puts us closer uh, in contact with, um, with with nature, for sure. It doesn't take much. It doesn't take much. It's getting your bare feet outside, even for 10 or 15 minutes. It's letting the sun rays hit your skin for a little bit. It's noticing the breeze through the trees it's recognizing that when 
you're talking to someone and there's a bird making noise outside your window that might mean something. It's starting to notice and allow. Yes. And it's magic. Yeah, there are days when we have a bird coming uh, to our bedroom window and knocks with uh, her beak several <laughs> times and sometimes she wakes me up. And there are days when we have an iguana, you know, clanging on the, on the glass trying to get in. So it's fun. It's fun and uh, really yeah. enjoy it. And, uh, and you mentioned uh, sun and, and different type of lights. And uh, this was mentioned um, recently by Elizabeth Wood, which described this type of uh, light, blue, white, yellow, green. And uh, it was quite um, interesting to find out how even sitting uh, by a tree, the light will be filtered through the, the leaves and you'll be exposed to, to green light, which will <clears throat> also heal certain parts of your body. So people should look into this type of uh, natural healing. So, yeah. <clears throat> cool, I've never heard that before. And I suppose if you're swimming in the ocean and the, the sun's filtering through the water, you're going exactly. to be receiving different light too. Yeah, and that's, all, that's the blue light. Then the sun has the uh, yellow light and the moon is the, the white light. So um, various type of, uh, again, natural mm, healing. And um, it's not dangerous to stay in the sun or you know, out, outdoors if you don't expose yourself um, too much. It's quite beneficial yeah. for your health for sure. Yeah, yeah. And sun gazing more at uh, sunrise and sunset is just divine, divine. Yes. Mm. Nicola, we're uh, approaching the end of uh, the interview. Any final thoughts? Always, always. Mm. I suppose a message of hope and inspiration that everything is perfect, everything is divine. Even the darkest nights can just be. This is, I've had many, many of these and even you know, the last couple weeks have been very low energy for me. And, you know, they go on for so long and you start going, what the hell's wrong with me? What's going on here? And really, it's just about finding some compassion for ourselves. It's about remembering that everything is, is perfect and fine and everything is going to Even with chaos, it's possible to still find our center. It's possible to still live a happy and joyous life. And not all life has to be happy and joyous, but we can find these, fre these frequencies and these vibrations and not attach to the feelings of despair and loneliness and allow, and instead just allow them to be, allow them to be within us and move through us when they're ready to move through us, to have conversations with them, to, to go into them wherever they're sitting in your body and just feel what it's like to sit in the epicenter of this. Find out what they're here to share with us. This, this self-inquiry is, is priceless and it's never ending. And it's such a gift. There's so much gold available to us once we learn a few simple tools yes. to have the wherewithal to know what to do and how to respond. Yes, thank you very much for uh, this wonderful message. <clears throat> it was a pleasure to, to have you uh, today on, uh, on, on my podcast. And uh, to my viewers, thank you for um, watching. Um, share it, like it. Um, get a free copy of my book when you go to uh, my website, claudiumurgan.com. And until next time, love and gratitude.